Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Blue Oval Podcast. I am Ben Weissel, and joining me, as always, Garrett Zatlin. How's it going, man? Ben, it has been a chaotic week, a good week um, at the beach with a bunch of my friends. Uh, if anyone hears a dog in the background, it's because I'm watching my friend's dog as uh, they are out to uh, out to the, the store to go get some food and uh, allow us to do this podcast. So um, all is good, and uh, we're figuring it all out for now. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. Um, I think that's a worthy price to pay for being out at the beach, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly worse things. I mean, I was able to write articles today uh, from the beach, so there's there's certainly a lot worse things. But um, is is this the heaviest writing period for you? Like these these ranking like these team it depends, rankings? It depends. for for over a month. Um, it's probably the heaviest. But in terms of like what are the actual most days? It is usually uh, the post rankings for the NCAA championships. Mm. Then that's when, because I usually have to leave to go see family for Thanksgiving. And so then I'm trying to get done stuff that would usually I'd have 24 hours to get done. I usually only have about 12 and it's just impossible. I was up until I think 3 a.m., 4 a.m. last year uh, before like my flight. So uh, I imagine that that will be uh, the same case this year. So it all kind of depends. It all depends on, on how you look at it. Well, best of luck to you during that period. But yeah, uh, you and the rest of the team have been doing a great job cranking out uh, these profile or these team rankings. Uh, we love doing it, but I mean, going as in depth as we do for each team, talking about their previous season, their coming, their upcoming season, why we're ranking them. It's just a lot of words to put on the paper for twenty five teams on the men and women's side. So. Um, Good for good for you getting it done. Uh, we did get some more ratings and reviews, or maybe just ratings. Uh, we're up to seventy three on Apple. Got one new rating, uh, two new ratings on Spotify, up to one fourteen. So I think people are gearing up for the season appropriately. We we did um, actually get a new review part of that. It's someone there who uh, they have a new son in the uh, in the collegiate space this fall. Uh, they just said they enjoy the passion and hearing uh, about the sport and our thoughts and all of the conversations. So thank you, welcome to the show. We appreciate it. it's like a little bit of a family here. Whether people like to be part of that family or not, they're now <laughs> part of the family. So uh, thank you and uh, and congrats to your son on starting his new career. So that said, uh, Ben, in terms of people who are starting new careers elsewhere. I like that transition. Pretty good that transition. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, we got some really interesting transfers. I was with my friends on, what was it, Saturday, Sunday night, um, when this uh, initial news broke about some Pac-12 stars. And uh, they were all like, what are you doing at 11 p.m.? And I was like, I have my job. So how about you kick us off here? So let's start with the group from UCLA. We saw Mia Barnett transfer to Oregon. Her uh, teammate, Delia Frias, also going to Oregon. And Ronan McMahon Staggs headed to the Pacific Northwest, but for fellow future Big Ten rival Washington. Um, some fascinating moves here. Uh, this We kind of expected this to happen after Sean Brosnan uh, did not have his contract renewed by UCLA. Um, but it's fascinating to see where these athletes are landing. These were top caliber names. Um, Barnett, obviously, in the 1500s, one of the best in the country, also strong cross-country runner, seems to fit the mold of what Oregon is building to a T. She's exactly what you would envision an Oregon runner to be. She's an elite miler. And she'll then contribute in cross country. She's ranked at TSR number fifty in our preseason individual rankings. Uh, I'm not giving that away. We we kind of kind of gave that as like a preview during that time. But she's also run 408 for 1500 meters. And guess who also runs 408? Claudia Kazmierska, Izzy Thorntonbot, and Maddie Elborn, Elmore. They're all returning this year, assuming there's no crazy pro signings, right? Mm -hmm. And now Oregon has four women who have run 408 for 1500 meters. Does anyone understand? How unbelievable that is. I, I mean, it's like the well, Washington men in the mile, like how many guys they had under what 353, 354. I mean, it's I, I it's hard to say what the equivalent is for a women's 1500 meter, but it's it's pretty darn close. Like, I think yeah. and you could maybe even argue that four women at 408 might be a little bit more impressive. Uh, and I, I would say so, too. I mean, Shalane Flanagan 
this is impressive. I mean, because it really could have been bad when, you know, Helen Lehman Winters was removed, right? You know, you had Kirsten Mirska still in the fringes of like, well, what is she going to do? Is she still yeah. going to come over from And I don't think you really know that, right? And then to develop Maddie Elmore, to, like the way she has, I mean, Elmore was good. She was never 408 good until this past spring. And then you go out, you grab Barnett, take the most of the, uh, of the opportunity. It's a monster, monster move. In Oregon now, it, it really depends because like Barnett, we believe can be a pretty significant impact score, maybe like a borderline true low stick. She's right on the cusp there. And you think about what she brings to the table and it's like, well, there's a lot of now technicalities that come with her ability to transfer, right? Because now this is her, I think, second transfer within a certain time frame. She's transferring when her coach uh, is the assistant coach, you know, the distance coach role mm-hmm. at UCLA was assistant not the director and because he's not the director or head coach um you know i I guess that's there's questions there as to like well can he um you you know is is that going to be enough for to be viewed as like an appeal to then transfer i guess i'd have to actually check i guess maybe he might have been the head cross coach so would that count i don't know all those technicalities uh for the NCAA side, I I feel like it would be a situation where if UCLA allows them, then there there's a greater chance. But yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting to see if all these UCLA athletes are able to run immediately. Um, and I I'm not really sure when we're gonna figure that out. Like I I, I think there's gonna be a, probably an appeal process. Um, and this could be drawn out for another few weeks or months. Yeah, I mean, it's also important to note, like, Ronan McMahon, McMahon Staggs, who's going to Washington. Right, he talk about him in yeah, a second. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, it also depends on the transfer window. Like, it's like, okay, well, does the transfer window apply to him? And, like, you know, the NCAA has been cracking down on multiple transfers within a year um, or just multiple tr- transfers, period. Um, and it doesn't just happen in track. It's happening in football mm-hmm. as well. So you you see these issues arising. You're like, well, what? When's Barnett going to be eligible? And I don't think we really know. I think UCLA, I, I don't know if they're going to like just like give her a waiver. But even if they do give her a waiver, is the NCAA going to allow it? It's very late. Like, I just really just don't know. So there's a lot of questions there. Ronan McMahon stags. Um if you didn't, if he didn't go to Washington, well, first off, how about this? Is there somewhere else that you thought he would go other than Washington? I mean, if he was going to stay on the West side of the U S I think that's the only real option. I I think in terms of, I mean, I I guess it could have seen him ending up in Oregon as well. Um, But I think Washington made a lot more sense there. If he was to go, East, I thought maybe an Ole Miss made sense, um, but it, yeah, I, I, I think ultimately Washington just makes the most sense geographically, and the Myler Myler group that they have is like second to none. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was going to be either Oregon or Washington. I think it made sense. West Coast school staying within, I guess, the well now Big Ten. Um, <laughs> about to head there. Still a weird thing to say. Um, elite Myler. You know, it wanted to be part of something new and fun. I think, you know, Brosnan originally gave him that, but now it's either you're going to the most elite group of milers ever or you're going to um, an Oregon program that's the new up-and-coming program, I guess, from where they should have been. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, for McMahon and Staggs, I can't be surprised. I think this makes total sense. Um, And I guess for Delia Frias, like, again, still trying to establish herself within the NCAA, but a good long-term piece and a really good long-term piece for what Oregon needs. Um, you know, she'll probably be eligible uh, to have the same time as, as Mia Barnett is. Obviously, she has the same questions that we have about, you know, the, the transfer situation. So um, just a, a huge haul. I thought this would maybe be more spread out, but I guess it makes sense that everyone's trying to get it all done at once, to try to get ready for the academic year. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, for Frias, I mean, she's shown signs 920 in the 3K, 444 in the mile, was 31st at ACC's uh, last fall. Like I, like you said, a very good long-term developmental piece. Uh, I think should have four years of uh, outdoor track and then three for indoor and cross country. So lots of eligibility there. I think fits perfectly with what Oregon's trying to do where they're not necessarily trying to go all in this year, but in the next few years and and she can be a big part of that so um fits i think perfectly um 
But I think that's it from the UCLA transfers. Do we want to go? Do you have anything else before we move on? Nope. Nope. Let's move on. All right. Let's go to our last transfer. Uh, Gracelyn Larkin going from New Mexico to Northern Arizona. The Northern Arizona women getting even stronger. Um, the One of the best um, returners from last cross-country season is now going to probably the most up-and-coming program on the women's side in, in Flagstaff. A really interesting move and one that could completely change the national title picture. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to say that they're national title favorites yet, but if you told me at the end of November that they're going to win the national title, that they did, that they did, I don't think I'd be surprised because you bring back Elise Stearns, you bring back Anika Rice. I think you I think they bring back Bryn Morley, right? But then they also add um, Ruby Smee, prior uh, cross country All American. You bring in Grayson Larkin, three time top thirty All American on the grass. Allie Upshaw, Maisie Grice, a top steeplechaser there. Like you look at this lineup, and you even think about some of the women that they returned from last year. This is a scary, scary, scary lineup. I, I mean, I would be really worried if I was NC State, Colorado, Florida. I mean, you're looking at those teams like. Man, not only does this team have a ton of firepower, but they're deep through five. You know, they have the support scores, they're experienced, they're consistent. Um, they're they're more certain. Like, I, I think I, we have more certainty about this team and now all of those women who are there than maybe the Colorado women or maybe the Florida women, maybe not NC State. But I would be very careful now with Larkin there, who brings probably the most upfront firepower certainty of anyone except Stearns. Yeah, I, I mean, it just gives them another automatic All-American. And, I mean, they're stacking up. Like, now I feel like they have at least three of those with the potential for a few other women to crash their way into that. And then all of a sudden you're talking about being able to compete with the NC States of the world when you have those five or six All-Americans and you know that they have the firepower up front to at least mitigate what NC State or other programs have up front in terms of the low, low stick. I mean, Elise Stearns and Nick Rice and Grayson Larkin are all going to probably be in that top 15, top 20. And that helps. You think, you think Anika Rice is Well, I guess, top yes. I'm, I'm going, getting ahead of my skis with Rice. Um, but I at least, uh, you know, Stearns is going to be a top 10 name. And you would expect um, Larkin to at least be a top 20 runner. Rice, I think we could see a step forward and maybe get there. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I feel very comfortable with her being an All-American. So, uh, just a huge upheaval for this NAU program who looked like they could take a little bit of a step back after a breakout year, but I, it looks like they're only going to be taking steps forward. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited for this team. Like, I, I think this is going to be the team where we're like, could by the end of the season, could we be asking the question, who's better NAU men or NAU women? And I think, think given all that NAU men have done that's an insane question to be asking a lot of it depends on how Upshaw does and if SME replicates her performance and if Grice translates her steeple, uh, steeplechase success but it's a crazy question to even ask and I and it's um, an exciting one as well yeah absolutely I mean they certainly look like the most well-rounded program by far uh, when you combine the men and women's programs um Anything else on transfers before we go to our team rankings? Let's get into the rankings, dude. I'm excited. So how, how do we want to do this? Do we want to go through team by team? Let's do, do we one, wanna... let's do one at a time. I think that we did that last year and it was effective. Okay, so let's start on the men's side and let's start at number 25, which was Florida State losing for Gall Curtin, their top scorer, but bringing in some big names um into the lineup this year via the transfer portal um they are bringing in let me make sure i have these names they are bringing in abdu zirak ibrahim from new mexico and ahmed ibrahim from boise state which should give them a nice influx of upfront um, upfront firepower um despite losing not only curtain but also paul stafford yeah, I mean, you know, I think when you look at this team, it's I, I think there's going to be some segments that go, 
well, you have, they have Abdi Rizak Ibrahim and they have Ahmed Ibrahim, which are not related, by the way. These two transfers, like how, like these two low star studs, like how are they only 25? They're you know, TSR number 25. And especially when I then go on to say, well, they also brought in Martin Pradonov, right, mm-hmm. from uh, the 339, 1500 meter runner, who's a 358 miler, 357 miler, excuse me. They bring back David Mal- uh, Malarkey, who is uh, 337, I want to say, for fi- uh, 5,000 meters didn't race on the grass. You start going through this, you're like, man, they're only 25. But both Ibrahims have struggled with injuries, especially Ahmed from Boise State. Like, they've had a lot of injury challenges. That's really tough to overlook. Like, also, you look back at last year, it's not like they were these superstar low sticks. They were fine at times, but Abdi Rizak Ibrahim was not like the same guy that we've seen him be in the past. And frankly, he's always been better on the national stage than in the regular season. Perdonov mm-hmm. hasn't raced since uh, spring of 2022, over a year. And Malarkey's never raced on the grass. So you start trying to balance the two. It's like, well, in a worst case scenario, Florida State's not even an honorable mention team. Where in a best case scenario, maybe they're even flirting with the top 10. But given what we saw last year, the questions that we have about this squad, but knowing their potential and knowing their talent, this ranking isn't about where are they right now or where should they be right now? It's how do we balance the best of both worlds? Yeah, I would push back on their ceiling being nearly that high. I think they could maybe be a top 15 program sure, sure. At, at best. Um, I I am not quite as bullish just I, because I, I think, like you said, there's been a lack of consistency from their new top guys, um, at least when it comes to the regular season. And I, I am a little worried about putting a ton of faith on them coming through and, and really being able to paper over what could be some concerns in that fourth or fifth spot. Um, I, I think Martin Perdodov is a nice addition for the track, but I, I, I don't know how much he's going to necessarily come in and help a ton on the grass. Um, I, I do like um, Malarkey. I think he will be, be a nice piece for them maybe be that third scorer, but I, I just, I, I truthfully don't know what we're going to get from those fourth and fifth spots, which makes me a little nervous about projecting them really much higher than this. It's funny. Cause I was just, you know, finishing up my, my analysis as I was just speaking to you and even uh, the dog here, Lula, my friend's dog didn't uh, even like that very much. I heard her moan and whine a little bit. So I clearly, <laughs> she doesn't even like this ranking um, as, as much as maybe I do. So we'll see. Um, we'll see. But I, I think it's fair to have some legitimate questions about this team, um, especially with the health, with the consistency. What's the depth going to look like? Like, can we rely on Padanov? You know, we there's so much uncertainty, but the raw talent is so crazy high. Mm-hmm. The names are there. Um, and I know we kind of did this a little bit last year, but I do think there's more talent with this group than Fiergal Curtin with Cooper Schroeder, with Paul Stafford, with Michael Toppy, right? Like, and Michael Toppy really didn't even get a true chance to kind of show himself last fall. He'll have a true chance now as a rising sophomore, redshirt freshman, I don't remember. But so I, I, I think this is more of like a, a nod of respect but I think people will look at this and be like, how are they only 25? It's like, well, there, there's actually maybe more questions than maybe some promised upside that I think a lot of us are expecting. So it's a very fine, fine game to play there. Agreed. Um, do we want to go to 25 on the women's side or do we want to keep going on through the men? Well, let's go 25 women's side. All right. 25 was California Baptist. Um, they obviously bring back Greta Karnuskate. Um, the star steeplechaser. Um, but what else do they have in this lineup that makes them an exciting team in our top 25 rankings? Yeah, Yasna Petrova was really the big low stick uh, mm-hmm. for them last year. She was solid. She was maybe more of a lead scorer than a low stick, but you know, her she's going to be huge uh, coming back there. There's a few other names here that like I want to actually pull up because it's impossible to say some of these European names that I will absolutely <laughs> butcher. Um, but you know, basically I, th- I think they lose, you know, two key scores, uh, male Porcher and, uh, one other name who I'm not even remembering off the top of my head right now. Um, so it, it's a lot of it does come down to, um, can Petrova replicate what she did last year, which I think is no problem. She was very consistent. Can Greta Karaneske translate her steeplechase success? Mm-hmm. And then can the returners just do their job? 
The real X factor, however, in all of this is Grace McLaughlin. For those of you who don't know, Grace McLaughlin is a, is a D2 writer here at the Strata Report. She does an awesome job. She's a veteran. Um, but she's been, you know, she's had some absences from racing and, uh, you know, but she, she's super talented. And she was previously at Gonzaga this past year, um, but she ran 9.22 and 16.09 for 3K factor, respectively, unattached. Those are really good times. Like, that, relatively, I don't know. I mean, y- y- your 342 might be rivaled now a little bit. Um, oh, that's better, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it's right there. Like, I'd, I'd say that you guys are right there. And I, I think that that could be really impactful. Like, Grace is very clearly talented now. It's like, hey, if she translates that over, 25 is, like, not a good enough spot for California Baptist. Uh, now, granted, we'll see, you know, how she performs this fall. And we're, we're wishing her the best. But also, you know, as we just look at this objectively, you kind of take a look. You're like, okay, they lose some, but they build here. And I, I think Grace is like the X factor in, in the Lancer season this fall. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And obviously, we're all going to be pulling for um, and ho- hope that she can be that that kind of real, add a nice scoring punch to this uh, CBU lineup. Um Maya, uh, or let's see, who, who, uh, Amelia Mixuda, um, I mm-hmm. think is also an interesting name that you mentioned um, in the article running 1008 in the steeplechase. Um, will she be able to come in after kind of being on the fringes uh, of the scoring lineup for um, the Lancers last year? Is she able to come in and be a little bit more impactful and add a little bit more punch to punch to this lineup? And then I, I think, uh, obviously, another X factor is what this Karen Uskate look like, like if she can be a, a true low stick this year compared to what she was last fall, then all of a sudden, and I think we're expecting her to at least be in an all American contention, but how good can she be? Um, how much of that steeplechase performances from this last spring? Can she translate? Because if she does and they have true, maybe two, maybe true low sticks, then that lessens the load on the rest of the lineup significantly. Uh, and, and I would agree. Um, I think that it's all like a collective effort. Do the returners replace what the middle lineup contributors did last year? Does Karen Eskate take that next step? What kind of role does Grace play? Um, I think you kind of look at all these factors and I don't think you need all of them to happen, but I think you need two of the three to happen, right? Like, I don't think yeah. it's, you know, I know we're saying like X is the Grace factor, but there's a couple different factors here that where this team could really, you know, find success. But I, I think there's legitimate questions about, you know, who takes steps up, you know, how the, the departures from last year get replaced. Um, so we'll see what happens, but I think this is a relatively fair spot given, you know, how they finished last season and where they were last season. So um, I don't know, maybe Grace can correct us and tell us we're wrong, but um, <laughs> we'll see. All right, let's wrap it up with them. Let's go to number 24 on the men's side where we ranked Princeton. Um, Princeton in a lot of ways, I think was the anti Harvard Um it, they're obviously uh, rivals in the Ivy League. They didn't have that pure upfront uh, scoring punch like Harvard did with Iverson and Graham Blanks. But what they did have is depth. And they add to that even more with a good recruiting class. They bring back a lot of strong talent. But I think we struggled to rank them because we just don't know how far up they're top five is going to be we feel like they could have a nice pack together but is that going to be good enough to make it to nationals and then if they do make it to nationals which we think they will how how far is that that going to be are they going to be in the top 100 top 120 where they where that pack lands is very much going to dictate where this team ends up they need more firepower they need more firepower and anthony monte and connor nesbitt are really solid like they're Mm -hmm. they're lead scorers i don't know if they're low sticks yet but they're really good. The problem is that Monty wasn't clearly at 100% in the postseason last year. Uh, you know, the depth really could only do so much. I mean, they just need more scoring potency. Um, I struggled to see with another year of experience with pretty much everyone and then some coming back into this lineup. I don't see how they're going to have like a bad race. Um, but it's it's really hard to kind of like look at this team and be like, who's going to be the low stick? Is it going to be Nesbitt? Is it going to be Monty? You know, is it going to be Nicklin Benson? Uh, Betenzen? Yeah. I, I don't I'm butchering that name i know that for a fact but he just ran what, i think 1335 uh this past yes. spring 
So there's a lot of different names like Daniel Bryan and Josh Zellick and Jarrett Kirk and Daniel, uh, I think I already said Daniel Bryan, but Jack Stanley. What happens to Cameron Fisher, the Mid-Atlantic champion from 2019? He's back, but we haven't seen him race. I mean, the, the options are endless, but who's going to come up and be the scorer there? Like the main high impact scorers, I don't think we know that. Yeah, they just have, I, I think the conclusion we came to was they just have too much talent on this roster when you kind of shake out everybody over the, the first month or two of the season. There's going to be at least five names that fall where they look good and look very competitive at a national level. Like there's just too much there. They've had too many good recruiting classes over the last few years, bringing in another solid group again this year. To be able to for them not to at least meet this ranking and then maybe six, uh, exceed it if, like we're saying, they can find one or two guys who they don't even have to be purely low stakes. Like you said, they can be lead scorers where they're, and I think, and it, it, correct me if I'm wrong in interpreting this, a lead scorer can be anywhere from that 40 to eight, like 60, 70 range at nationals yep. where they're not a pure, like they're not an all American but they are right on the fringe and they're leading the team pretty well. If they can just get one or two of those guys to fit that criteria, I think they're in perfect shape. Yeah. And I also, you mentioned this, I think twice now, that recruiting class is really good and really underrated. And they're mostly cross country specialists, except maybe Colin Bowler. Um, But Christian Grondek is really good. Weston Brown is really good. Colin Bowler is more of a track guy, but you run 847 for 3,200 meters. I believe you can be pretty good on yeah. the grass too. So uh, Brian Bowler, his brother, was also pretty solid. But yeah, I, I like this team a lot. Like they're a really cool team. They're a fun team. Like I pretty much like everyone on this roster. And I mean everyone, but someone's got to step up. Someone's got to be better. It, that You have to have an All-American somehow. I don't even know if we even had someone in like our honorable mentions, right? Which means that it's like, you're, we're not theory, like we're not projecting anyone for a top 70 finish. And they kind of need that basically once we get to the national meet. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I think we, we think of Harvard having a higher ceiling than this team, but Princeton proved last year that they can beat them at Ivy leagues and that their depth is just better. And, and I, I think that's going to be even more the case this year it's just they obviously don't have, as I mentioned at the top, those two low sticks. But I think the gap between these two programs at the national level is going to on, is going to continue to shrink. And who knows? We they they might end up challenging them at the national level a lot more than we think. I, I think that's fair, and I think that was kind of the the theme from last year. It was like, hey, um, they're, they're they're a little closer than I think we realize. So very fair. Absolutely. Let's go to the women's side and Furman is our number 24 team. Um, Have uh, some good returners, um, but what made them one of the more interesting teams for you guys to rank? I think it's more of like what has been the last few years and leading up to this. Um, Bethany Graham's a true low stick. They yep. have that solid you know, low stick to kind of lead them. Abigail Robertson's been a quietly great number two. And then they kind of return everyone. They've got a high upside youngster in Jenna Mulhern who showed promise last year. They got a lot of depth. A lot of women get older. They pretty much returned everyone from last year except Megan Ford, who didn't even race after the Louisville Lexi Classic. I think we also look at this, and this is kind of the conversation I had with Mara, is that like, I don't think we really, I think we naturally expect them to get better. And I think when you kind of look at their season as a whole, they really weren't that bad. They really weren't. You look at Nutty Comb, they were within striking distance of Michigan State, um, who was all the way up, I think, in 18th place. And I think Berman was 22nd, which isn't that great. But if you're just looking for the top teams in the country, 22nd at Nutty Comb is just on the fringes of our ranking here. Um, they soundly beat a national qualifying squad in West Virginia. Um, the structure's good. You know, I think this is just a team where I think the, the main theme that we tweeted out was they're, are, they're all grown up and they should be all grown up. And this should be the year where we, they, we really see them take a jump. Um, so I'll be excited to see if that happens. Um, but, but it does require a little bit of projection and speculation. I think you would probably agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny coming off of just talking about the Princeton men. It, I mean, it's not dissimilar, except for they have that low stick in Bethany. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. they, they don't have maybe as many options as Princeton does for scorers, but 
They have a true low stick. They have women who are young and improving. Like you said, Mulhern, I mean, 32nd at regionals in a, in a deep Southeast region. It's very solid. If that's your, if she can improve some more and then they can get a little bit more out of Megan Marvin or Emily Little or some of these other women, like they have the ability just by natural improvement uh, to do a lot better better than what their cross country results showed last year. So yeah, I, I I think it is funny that the the number 24 teams 24 teams do kind of mirror the, uh each other in a way um where one has a little bit more of an advantage in the low stick, one has a little bit more advantage in the depth, but both were kind of projecting forward where they were the year before. Yeah, and and again I don't really think we got a good idea of like how good Furman was. Like fine, you want to take a look at just Nuttycomb Sure, but the Cola scenario was completely against them. They didn't advance to the national meet, even though they very well could have had one tiebreaker in another region gone another way, right? The the women teams who did beat them were all ended up being top 10 teams at the national meet, and who they beat at Louisville Classic was just a, a team that, frankly, they should have beaten. So yeah. it really, it's just, it's like, okay, well, you're going to really put stock into one race? And sure, maybe that's just how the season goes, but this is a team that could have very easily been on the national stage and no one would have been surprised. And I think if they had made the national stage, maybe this ranking looks a little um, easier to digest, I'd say. And I think there's maybe even less questions. But this is this team's very, very talented in terms of their potential, in terms of what they can do this season. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think we don't usually put a lot of weight into regional results, but I think for them, their regional result shows that they're clearly close to like being nationally relevant last year. And with a little bit more improvement, they they certainly are. And and, I mean, because that was their season right there. If I mean, their season ended right there and they they gave a good performance against, like I said, some top, top, like when you're going up against the NC States, the North Carolinas, the Virginias of the world, like these are very, very good programs that they're trying to hang with and beat everybody else who is also targeting those teams. So, I mean, I I, I think this is actually a really good spot for them and, and provides us, I think, a lot of flexibility as we rank them throughout the season. And they, great work. Flexibility. Um, we'll see. I, hopefully they give us flexibility to move them up. I'd like to reward them, but... <laughs> We'll see what happens. All right. Number 23 on the men's side, Tulsa. And this, oh man, we had a we had a couple of these on the men's side. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you felt the same way on the women's side. But, man, they lost so, so much. They lose Cormac Dalton, Isaac Akers, Michael Power. Like, that is as good of a trio as any team lost in the country. They bring back Shane McAvoy, who improved throughout the fall last year. When I was doing a write-up for another team, I noted that he was behind some guys that you really wouldn't have expected uh, Mm -hmm. to start the fall season and and really gradually improved, had a good track season. He should be a a true low stick for them. Um, Christian Baker, good steeplechaser. But man, we are projecting forward based off of some times and based off of his Tulsa program that has been nationally relevant and figure out a way to be that way for a long time now. It, it's such a hard team to figure out because Me- McAvoy, Shane McAvoy is really good and he's really underrated and he's very consistent, which is important, right? Mm-hmm. So he gives you one guy that you know for a fact is there. After that, no idea. I mean, really, it could be any. It could be multi prop who like had moments where he wasn't terrible, but I think it's been a little unfair because well, like, I, and I and let me let me do explain. I know that sounds like an insult. Complimenting but it's not. with faint phrase. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that like I, I think because of how elite Tulsa's top four was last year, we're all looking. We're all like, oh well, that's the fifth man that's holding them back. When in reality, like if he's the fifth man for a team outside of the top twenty, that's actually not terrible. Yeah. You know, like he, he's actually pretty okay in a certain points. Like I think he was top seventy at Cowboy Jamboree. Which, if you're top seventy at Cowboy Jamboree, is the team's fifth score. That's a good problem to have. Like that's not terrible at all. Yeah, sixtieth. He was sixtieth, right? So I mean, that's perfect. 
So I think you, you when you look at a team that's at TSR number 23, you have him. You have an 838 steeplechaser. You have a guy from the UK who's young, growing, and made in the 1350s. You have a ton of other young guys who are developing. So like, it, there are pieces here. And I think this is probably one of the best young groups that they've ever had. You know, there's another guy who took down Snell Masando, the top Juco transfer uh, for this year. So, like, the pieces are there. Have to project again, but the the low stick scoring potency is absolutely there. We know that for a fact. The talent is there for a lot of these guys. And when you really look at some of these other guys and where they've been and how they've improved, I don't think it's crazy to be like, hey, I think TSR number 23 is the right spot for them. Yeah, I like a lot of these guys who come in um, from overseas with good cross-country experience. Johnny Livingstone um, from Great Britain ran for the U-20 Euro Cross-Country Championships team. I like that. He obviously has 1351 5K PR as well. Um, Luke Birdseye, also 28th place finisher at the U-20 World Cross. Um, You mentioned in the article about him finishing right uh, behind Cole Matheson. Like I, I, a lot of these guys um, that they're bringing over have good experience on the grass. And I, admittedly, the, the cross country in England is far different than it is in America in terms of the difficulty. The U.S. is a lot more like running on the track than what they experience. But still, I, I, I value that almost as much as really good track times because they know how to uh, run cross country, the ebb and flow, the the dif- the different paces, moving up the hills. Well, um, it'll just be interesting to see how quickly they can assimilate. And and I, I think that's kind of the issue with ranking Tulsa here is we don't know how quickly a lot of these guys who haven't been in the lineup or haven't been in the NCAA how quickly they're going to be ready to go and be key members of this team. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Um, so a lot of, like, you know, like we said with Furman, except more so with Tulsa, it's all projection. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, I struggle to believe that a guy who is 60th at Cowboy Jamboree with a top 20 All-American low stick with, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out an 838 steeplechaser and young overseas guys who have run 1350s and who have beaten top Juco talents, all of that jazz. I think it's I think it's very difficult to ignore their talent there. Absolutely. All right, let's go to 23 on the men's or on the women's side, excuse me. Florida State, they looked like they're going to be, bring in Riley Penn this year. Um ended up she ended up transferring to Louisville. They do lose Emmy Vandenberg, but they do bring back Allison Churchill and some and most of their lineup in fact from last year. Um it'll be interesting in a south region um that has kind of gone on a little bit of harder times um, than it has in years past. How, uh, uh, and because of that, I think they should still be favorites to make it to the national meet, but it'll be interesting to see what they look like when they get there with uh, a lineup that doesn't have as much oomph as maybe we thought it could at one point. And that's a great way of phrasing it. They don't have as much oomph. And I think, I don't think anyone knows what that means, but I think they do (laughs) all at the same time. Um, losing Emmy Vandenberg is tough, but this team also placed 18th at the national meet last year. So you take her out and you'd be like, okay, well maybe Allison Churchill improves a little bit here. What does Elizabeth Thunder, uh, yeah, Elizabeth Thunderberg, that's a, that's a tough name to say. Um, what does she do? Cause she's been injured, uh, recently over the last year or so, um, maybe two years, I should say, but you know, she was great in 2019, mm-hmm. like really good borderline low stick, I think came into our preseason rankings ranked in the top 50, um, so like, does she get back to, to top form or even just halfway decent form? Because all she just needs to do is just plug some holes, right? Agnes Matigue is a really solid name up there. Um, they bring back some returners, but the, the depth department's really thin. They didn't have Leah Stevens anymore who had decommitted and then went to N- NC State. They need Funderburg to kind of step up in some capacity and offer some level of scoring. Because if she does, then you basically have the same team as last year, maybe maybe a little bit less. And I think that's why we justified it at TSR number 23. But Coach Bailey Myers leaving was far more devastating than, hey, you just lost your coach. It's you lose a potential back and contributor who offers depth in Riley Penn and can also be great in the middle distances. You lose Leah Stevens, who was going to have to be necessary to uh, instantly you know, contribute to this team right away. So... I think this is a ranking that's a little bit on the question mark side, but um, there are avenues for this team to find success. 
And you lose a coach who has, uh, like Coach Brayman on the men's side, has been able to refresh this roster and, and kind of develop talent at, despite may, despite a lot walking out the door um, and being able to have new women plug holes every year. And it, it's just, like you said, it, it, there are going to be a little bit more talent to replace this year than we maybe expected. And who steps up? If any of those women who were in the lineup last year, if they can take a step forward and kind of recover some of those spots, that's going to be that's going to determine where they land. Ultimately, it's going to come down to internal improvement. They aren't getting the big transfer that's coming in, at least not yet. um, That's going to save them and give them a, a more depth or a true low stick. It's going to be just the women who were in the lineup last year, just being a little bit better to replace the Emmy Vandenbergs um, of the world. Couldn't agree more. Do you want to move on to 22? 22 on the men's side, the Butler Bulldogs. And talk about replacing your top star in Barry Keene. They brought in, I I think, someone who fits his profile as well as you would expect, as well as you could really realistically expect. Um, And that, of course, is the CBU... Uh, transfer lapelic um, not quite this the same cross country low stick but someone who has the track times that you could absolutely see him getting close to that mark yeah I like this team a lot like I really like this team um, it's the same team as last year except you're replacing your low stick Barry Keen with Florian lapelic and at first glance you're like okay well this team's just going to take a step backwards then and maybe maybe that's the case but LaPelle just ran 1329 and 1330 for 5000 meters this past summer and those are really good times. Like those are times mm-hmm. where I'm like, okay, he might be an all-American kind of guy now. Now I think we still need to see it and that's why he was a just missed name, but those were really good marks. And I don't think the scoring is going to be dramatically different with LaPelle in there instead of Keen and then you add in Will Zagarski who ran 340 1347 for 5000 meters as a freshman, right? You add in you know, bring back Matthew Forrester, who's run great in steeplechase. You've got two really nice overseas guys. Jack McMahon just ran 1350s in the 5K. He was a back-end guy last year. There are names on this roster. Jesse Hamlin just had a yep. phenomenal indoor track season, 744 for 3K, uh, All-American in the 3K. He was already pretty solid. Like, you start going down this list, and you're like, did we did we rob them of a few spots? Because, like, I, I think there's a really good argument for Butler being a lot better than TSR number, maybe not a lot better, but at least a little bit better than TSR number 22. I think it's just a matter of like, we are banking on everyone translating some of their recent success to the grass. And I think we just need to see that first. Agree. And and Hamlin has been a guy who seemingly has improved his range every season or every year, um, slowly gotten better. Um, he came in as more of a middle distance guy and, and obviously his great 3k, this indoor season, uh, was eye opening and has slowly gotten better on the grass as well. He's someone that I think they can really, really rely on as kind of with, with keen guy, keen gone. And maybe Hamlin's not going to be that number one with Lapelic there, but I think he's going to be kind of that tent pole runner for the rest of the lineup to revolve around in a lot of ways of, Hopefully LaPelic's a little bit ahead. The rest of the lineup's right behind um, Hamlin, and he can lead a, maybe a pack right there. Um, and, and you mentioned a lot of their overseas guys. I mean, they come in with really good times. Um, Martin Kovacic uh, from Czech Republic coming in with 847 steeplechase. They got guys. Um, and and, and uh, David Slavic, uh, another Czech talent who ran at the U20 Worlds and U- in Euro Cross Country Championships. Again, love that experience. I I think I, I hear what you're saying about robbing them, but it would require all these guys to hit. And even if they get a 60% hit rate, I think they're going to be realistically right around this 22 range and maybe even a little better. So I, I, I think they're perfectly ranked for the amount of talent but inexperience that they bring to the to the table. Well, I think I, th- I think what you say is perfect. If it's just sixty percent hit rate, yeah. this team is already going to be doing pretty well. Um, let's ask a quick question before we move on to the next team. Who's the most important runner on this team? 
I think it's Lapelic. I I, I, I just Hamlin. yeah. I I just feel com- I I I feel so confident about him. Like I don't. I'm not. I I think. And like I said, I think he'll be their temple runner. I, I just think he'll be so consistent that I'm. I I don't think he'll be as important. I think Lapelic giving them that maybe true low stick or not even true low stick, but a true lead runner will be ultimately a lot more impactful. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I think, I think Hamlet's got to be like an all American if this team's really going to be like threatening the top 15. Oh, uh, agreed. I, 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 yeah. If they're going to exceed their ranking, then, then probably he's their most important guy. That's true. Yeah. So, all right. Who's our uh, 22 on the women's side? 22 is the Toledo women who just continued to impress year after year uh, under new coach, uh, Andrea, um, oh, what am I, what's her last name? Um, Andrea Grove McDonough. Grove McDonough, thank you. Um, they bring back um, a really good lineup. They bring back they bring back Joy Chichir and Faith Linka, right? Correct. They bring back everyone. Correct. Okay, uh, they bring back everyone. Perfect. Um, it's... <laughs> They're going to have their work cut out for them every year in that Great Lakes region on the women's side. But they bring, like you said, they bring back everyone. This is a team that se- has seemingly improved almost season after season. I, I'm honestly a little surprised that they weren't a little higher. They're really inconsistent. They're really inconsistent. Like they were, eh. At Joe Piani, they they lost to Illinois in a head-to-head matchup at John McNichols' invite. They were phenomenal at Nuttycomb, like way yep. better than expected. Like the depth came through. Um, and then they were bad at the national meet. <laughs> so I we just we just don't know. Like at their best, if everyone runs well on the same day, this team's probably better than 22, sure. But they haven't mm-hmm. proven that. And yeah, they return everyone, but like where like where's the scoring coming like where who's being more consistent right they need everyone to be at their best on the same day if they have the talent and they've proven that they can do it like nutty was a great example of how good this team can be but everyone needs to run well on the same day and and that's the issue so i think you look at where they were last year you take a look at you know what the projection is what needs to happen um yeah I'm, I'm, maybe they could have been higher but until they prove that i'm not sure yeah, and I, I think I have that nutty comb result maybe stuck in my head. But I, I, I just think bring back that lineup that has proven that their top end capability is probably better than a lot of these teams in this range. And, and hopefully they have a, a few more pieces. It's a program that's developing more and more talent just internally. I, I think they're going to have a lot more options for that top seven, which I think will make them hopefully a little bit more consistent where they can kind of plug and play different women into the lineup depending on who's running well um and just being another year more experienced i I think should make everyone a lot more consistent but i I think that's a very very valid fair critique um let's move on to 21 here uh on the men's side that was i'm missing our list the michigan men michigan men that's right that's right i'll let you take the lead here Oh, okay. Um, I, so, I, can, I can take it if you want. I'm, go I'm ahead, because I don't know what to do with this team, man. I I really we I I don't know if you struggled with them as much as I did, but I just they they talk about oomph and not having it. This is a team that doesn't quite have the oomph. I think they do have the oomph, but they just never showed it. And I think right. here's the thing: they lose Arjun Jha, who was a lead scorer slash low stick, right? But Tom Brady's a lead scorer. And Nick Foster, at his best, is a lead scorer slash low stick. The problem is that no one, they, they all three of their low sticks, their lead scores, whatever, had to run well on the same day. And they usually had at least two of them do so. The other one was either not running or they just didn't run well at all. And it was usually Nick Foster. But Nick Foster's a lot better since then. He's been so much more refined, so much more poised. Even if it was just in the mild distances, he also ran great in the 3K. He looks like a different runner. He really does. Mm-hmm. He looks far more mature as a racer. And I think that's going to help this team. Not only that, but although they lose Ja, they do bring back Owen McKenzie. They bring back everyone else. They bring back an 844, 3200 meter runner from high school. They bring in Heath McAllister, who's run 850 for uh, two miles. There are some dudes on this team. 
There, there's some young guys as well. Ollie Raymond, I think, is pretty solid. Zach Stewart's experience. Um, I think Tom Brady and Nick Foster together, like, really give this team a nice one-two punch. I think as a cohesive unit, they can all be together pretty well. But, yeah, they got to be a little more consistent. And Foster has to be the guy who we saw Joe Piani last fall, except for the entirety of the season. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, Foster and Brady give them two experienced guys who you feel comfortable about having a high enough ceiling that they can be a, a fair top two when you're going up against teams in this range. I think, and, and like you mentioned, they have a lot of different guys who have the potential um, to be solid scorers in that third to fifth spots. And again, you don't need a perfect hit rate. You just need a fit. Like if you can roll the dice, have 50, 50 and have half of them hit, then you're fine. Um, it'll just be interesting to see. It, it's hard to say which guy that's going to be, or who's going to step up, but we feel confident in this program under Kevin Sullivan being very competitive at the national meet. They've kind of proven it time and time again, that they can, even though they haven't looked great, they can figure out a way of, qualifying for the national meet and putting together a solid performance. So they don't excite me, but I think they're a super solid team at the number 20 spot. And I think that's exactly, they're reliable. They usually deliver most times. And even when they don't, it could always be worse. So um, (laughs) I I like, I still like them as a team. I mean, they made me look really good in 2019 when I made this bold prediction and ever since then i have a soft spot for them kevin sullivan made me look good he made me look smarter than i really am um and i I just like this team i think they they got the right pieces and i do think they will be better this year i think they just have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together at the same time agreed let's go to number 21 on the women's side and that is oregon state they bring back their two stars uh kaylee mitchell and grace featherstone ha they will be central to everything that this team does they really can't afford off days from either of them uh thankfully that hasn't been a situation that they've really ever been put in like those two women are consistent and great up front the rest of the lineup has slowly been getting better i feel like over the last few years and they're going to need to continue to get better i think to justify this tsr number 21 ranking. well not only that but like everyone else returns um and they bring in transfers grad transfers or well transfers and grad transfers most importantly delaney griffith from uh, uh boise state and sage brooks sage brooks was 32nd at um cowboy jamboree last fall for perspective Paul O'Donnell on the men's side of Syracuse was 31st. And we're like, great race, Paul O'Donnell, <laughs> great race. And it was, it was a great race. But if Sage Brooks, who was, I, I want to say she was injured. I don't know that for sure. But if she comes into this lineup and she's able yeah. to do that performance over and over and over again, it's like, whoa, whoa. Like Oregon State might have something here. Like they, they might be a really big problem. Whereas Delaney Griffith, she ran, uh, you know, 933K, 1625K. And that's solid. But she was 31st at the West Regional Lexi Championships. That is going to be a massive cutoff of scoring from where this team was last year. 50th at Joe Piani isn't amazing, but it keeps the scoring down. It allows, you know, it doesn't allow for excessive scoring. Like this team, by just those two transfers alone, are going to be much better than they were last year. They were already a national qualifying squad. And every one of these returners comes back. They were super young. They're going to be experienced, get another uh, another year older, and they'll get, you know, simply better with natural growth, or at least one of them will. So I like this team a lot. I think they could be really scary good. Um, a lot has to happen. But the like Brooks has proven she can do it. Griffith has proven she can do it. They have an elite one-two punch. There's really not that much more that needs to happen in order for this ranking to make sense and then maybe even more. And and their third through fifth scores don't have to be great. That's the thing. Like you you mentioned solid performances at Joe Piani and Cowboy Jam. Like they just need to be okay. Like in an okay three through five will put this team within the top 20. No problem. It's just do. And I think they have a lot more options. As you mentioned, they have the transfers. They have the their returners, and then they have a ton of freshmen. Like they they just have a lot more lottery tickets of being like, hey, we just need one of you to unexpectedly break out, and then we got another person that we can 
add to our transfers to our lineup last year. And hopefully we're looking at not having just a humongous drop off from number two to number five. Like as long as they can just not fall off a cliff in any of their three, four, five scores, they're going to be just fine. So I, I, I hear you. It'll be fascinating to see though, where and who kind of emerges to lead this team, hopefully a little further than they have been before. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the freshmen. You know, there there's some really good rookies coming into this team. You know, I want to say they have like a Ruby Broadbent uh, who's run 1620 for 5,000 meters. Katie Kopech, she was 28th at Champ Sports National Championships this past uh, past fall. Like, there are some really good talents here that I think are maybe potentially more impactful than we could than we maybe realize. So I like this for Oregon State. I'm excited for them. I'm trying to stay cautious. Don't want to get overexcited. But we think this is a roughly a good spot for them. All right, let's wrap it up with our number 20 for the men and women's side. On the men's side, we have NC State, who lose lead scorer Ian Shanklin. But as they proved last year, like when this lineup is all together and running well, they are super dangerous. Obviously, losing Shanklin is going to be a big blow, but they have guys coming back and they have reinforcements that I think can make them almost as good as they were last year. Yeah, I I think it's tough. I mean, you take out Shanklin, the scoring structure gets to be a little tricky. Like you go through the results last year. If you take Shanklin out, like you're already at this point. And they also lose Robinson Snyder, who was their second scorer at ACC's. He was a back end scorer at Nuttycomb and at the national championships. Like he's really good. And I think people are just kind of like glossing over the fact that he's lost. Like, He's really yeah. good, and he's now gone. And you lose someone like that. Like, you take out the top two scores of NC State's lineup from the ACC championships, and people would be like, how are they even 20th in these rankings, right? The difference is that Ian Harrison was a lot better than some people maybe want to give him credit for, or maybe will we'll acknowledge or just recognize. And Brett Gardner, same thing, was really mm-hmm. solid as a secondary scorer, almost like a lead scorer in some cases, like a Joe Piani. Uh, those guys were also great at big time meets. They weren't their best at ACCs, but generally speaking, really solid, great years on the track. And Hannes Berger is back. Um, I thought he would be gone by now, but he's he's back and uh, he's a great number three scorer to have. After that, gets a little tricky. Toby Galter is probably the fourth name and he's probably going to be pretty good. But when it hits the fifth, sixth, seven spots, I'm not super confident. I don't know who those guys are going to be. I worry about highly excessive scoring, and I think it changes the scoring structure of this team pretty significantly. Yeah, I, it'll just be fascinating to see who steps up um, because there there are going to be there is going to be some new names that need to make impact make an impact on this team because uh, of the losses and just for consistency sake they just need more options <laughs> like that with i mean gardner harrison great lineup guys maybe they can be more than that and, and like you said I, I i do like burger coming back um it's just i i don't know who that's gonna be like at travis kokomar coming over from campbell I, I we had high hopes for him last year can he kind of step up a little bit more? Can the recruiting class be impactful? There's just a lot of question marks. Um, but this, again, I, I feel like we've fallen back on this a few times. Like with Michigan, this is a program that knows how to get it done at the national level. And ultimately, I think we have a little bit of faith there where a lot of teams are losing key contributors. And we feel like they bring back enough and have enough institutional knowledge that they they deserve this number 20 ranking. Yeah, and it's one of those things where they were better than last year than we than we expected, right? Like yep. I think we ranked them 22. Um this this is a good team and a good program. I worry about this depth though. Like Dan Magui might be that fifth guy and if he's that fifth guy, awesome. But then they have no room for off days and they had a couple guys yep. have an off day here or there. And I don't know if they have a true low stick. And I don't know if Dan Magui is going to be that fifth guy or how the the Toby Galter is going to come in as a transfer. There are legitimate questions here. So tough to say, and they could very easily, you know, uh, ex- exceed this ranking. But I think it's fair to have questions when a usually deep team appears to be limited on depth. 
Absolutely. Let's go to the women's side. And at number 20, that is the Wisconsin Badgers. I'm going to I'm going to drop the mic here and let you uh, explain this team. All depth, no low sticks, period. <laughs> Sound familiar? Period. <laughs> period. That, that's pretty much all it is. Um, great group, interchangeable at times. Uh, Shea Ruli is like probably a lead scorer, but Victoria Hellegrenthal could be better. She has struggled a little bit last year. Same thing with Alexa Wesley. The team could be a lot better, and we might even be under-ranking them given that they really don't lose anyone. They, they lose Lucinda Crouch, but they – Add in Maya Real, who was a really nice score for Harvard last year. Um, they're they're not an exciting team, but that doesn't mean they're a bad team. You know what I mean? Like they're just like one of those teams that just get the job done. They don't really have a ton of flaws. Like they're never going to give you an awful performance as long as they have everyone. But uh, that's that's just kind of it. You know, like I don't, I don't really know what else to say. And I think when you look at the teams ranked ahead of them, I think we like how those teams restocked or how they brace themselves for their departures uh, in comparison to Wisconsin, despite Wisconsin basically just basically having the same team. So, yeah, I, I mean, it. We run into this issue, I think, every year uh, with the rankings: is how good can it all depth team? take you and i think 20 is about that range like where we've landed we've landed with oh we've put some teams a little bit higher i think portland men come to mind a few a year or so ago where we we put a, put them a little bit higher but i think they had a little bit more maybe more experience than this team um but ultimately like this is a team that's just gonna need to pack up and, and move together well like I, I, again i you list off the names it's just going to need to be a group that takes a step forward together or someone needs to have a breakout year. And who knows, that might happen and they might have a low stick or a, a true lead runner emerge. Um, and she really could absolutely be that woman. But you're kind of forecasting a little bit of, of progress here on this team, which is a forward uh, facing ranking. That's what we have to do here. Um and, and they have the program, they have the names that you would expect them to be able to do that. Well, and a lot of it's just like, this is basically the same team as last year. It's really not yeah. that different at all. And last year's team, I think we ranked them at like, what, 13th, 14th coming into the, the preseason rankings. And then they ended the national meet at 19th, which was probably the middle ground between all of their performances from last fall. It was about right, roughly on par. So... To rank them at 20 really isn't that much off from what they were last year. No. It's the same team. It's roughly the same spot as where their their average was from last year. I think it makes sense. I'm sure they're maybe not the the most thrilled team right now, but where they're getting their ranking at, it feels like no one ever is. But um, everyone should be a top five team. Um, but regardless, um, I, I'm I think this is probably right. Although I do think that at this spot they probably have more upside than I would say that about a few other teams that we've already ranked. Yeah, no one's ever thrilled about where they land on the rankings. So I, I hope that through this podcast and by reading the articles, you can at least understand how we got there. We're not going to bat a thousand, but I think our, our uh, process of thought is good um, and, and leads to more correct answers that, than not. So um let's wrap it there we got obviously plenty of more teams to rank throughout the summer um looking forward to talking about that further um anything before we go no go check out the site uh, i'm working on a few things finalizing a few things gonna be some some cool stuff coming um so i'm excited like i'm, I'm really excited and uh but we got team rankings now um i'm gonna go to the beach and uh everyone's just gonna have a good week all right so that's all I got on my end. Ben, uh, do you have anything more on your end? All right. So Ben, I know you and I are having some technical issues and technical difficulties here, but we got through the podcast. We're making it happen. You've been a trooper. I'm going to let you go and cut off your mic for now, but thank you everyone for listening and uh, for checking into the rankings. Come back next week. We'll all have better Wi-Fi, and uh, we'll make it happen from there. But in the meantime, I'll talk to you all then. Thanks. <laughs>